Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of That Creative Life. I have my friends here, Dave and Jay, and amazing photographers. And I'm going to preface this episode by everyone go on Instagram and search at JN Silva and then at Dave.Krugman. Krugman, did I say your last name right? You said it perfect. Okay. And they are amazing photographers, and it's going to give you some context around our conversation um, because you were, y- y'all were some of the first photographers where I started following, and it was like, oh, these aren't just Instagrammers, right? These are people who are actually professional photographers, and it's been really fun to watch you guys over the past few years. So welcome, and I'm very excited to, to chat with, with you guys and to share your journey. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. <laughs> I feel like I need a clap track on here. Um, but just for some context, let's go Dave and then Jay in. Um, what was kind of the first photograph you ever took that was like, I want to do this for real? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. Mine goes pretty far back. I was fortunate enough to be exposed to photography at a very uh, young age, my grandfather and father kind of shared it as a hobby when they were when my dad was growing up. Mm-hmm. So they had a dark room in their house, oh, wow. and then you know collected a ton of gear, which is actually um, I'm lucky enough to have had a lot of that gear make its way, you know, through my Love father it. to me. Uh, so that was really a huge boon to my photography and my interest in photography. But it was at summer camp actually. I was like at this creative arts camp up in. Uh, uh, like Northern Vermont. And I was trying to sign up for a woodworking class. I was like 10 years old or something like that. And the woodworking class was full, but they're just like, you know what? Why don't you go next door? They're doing darkroom photography. Huh. I was like, all right, whatever. And so I went in there <laughs> and they gave us Nikon F1s, like, the, you know, these classic film, mm-hmm. black and white film camera. Or I mean, it sh- could shoot color too, but we were shooting black and white film. And I remember I went down to the water and there's this rowboat kind of like turned over on the, on the shore. And I kind of framed it up and then I went back with the role and we developed the role and I was like, okay, this is fine. But then there was a moment after uh, the paper, you know, you, you expose the paper, the photo paper to light. It's photosensitive, but it doesn't look like anything until you slide it into the developer. Mm-hmm. And there's this moment in the dark room, it's like all red light, super so moody, moody vibe in there. Yeah. Uh, and it just felt like seeing the image arise in the developer was the closest thing I've ever experienced to witnessing magic. Hmm. I was like, oh my God, what is this? And that really got me hooked. Um, and How th- old were you? I was probably like nine or 10, okay. maybe 11. Yeah. It gets hazy when I go that far back. <laughs> but uh, that was definitely my catalyst moment of like, always wanting to chase that feeling of yeah. like, you can press a button and, and create art. Cause I always loved visual art, but I was never that talented as a you know painter or you know I wasn't that good at drawing. Still, I'm not. Um, but that was a moment where I was like, maybe I can be a visual artist oh. if 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 I can like take this route. Amazing. Yeah. How about you. Wow, amazing story. I don't know how I can follow this. <laughs> <laughs> I was not that young. Um, it was a little bit later in life. I had moved here from Venezuela uh, at 11, and it was a few years later um, when we moved here. We kind of like left on a whim, so we left all our you know belongings and like everything that we had back home uh, and that included our photo albums so after a few years here i was like oh yeah there aren't like many photos of me as a Mm -hmm. child you know because all of that was left behind um and i was an only child for most of my life at the time i was like 15 16 and my mom remarried here and you know she was pregnant with my little sister which was like the most amazing thing at the time and it was when she was born that i happened to have a camera kind of just like handed down I, I forget who gave it to me it was like a two or three megapixel one of like the very first yeah. like digital wow cameras. that's insane to just hear two yeah. to three megapixel and it was crazy to have that back then and you know i was playing around with it and i was like you know i gotta make sure that all of my sister's life is documented mm-hmm. since i don't have any of my own uh images and she was maybe one around one we had just gotten a new puppy so we had a new puppy laying around a baby and a puppy i know crazy times Gold. in our household yes you know? <laughs> and i took this photo of my sister sitting on the couch with the puppy like right next to her and i remember like as soon as i looked at it i was like whoa why is this so beautiful like i love this image so much and yeah. you know she had the perfect expression she had a little like pink hat on and the puppy was just like so calm happy sitting next to her 
And it was later that I realized we had some really incredible uh, window light coming through. Mm -hmm. And it was just like casting this perfect like balance of light and shadows coming through. And it took me a while, but that was the first image that I was like, whoa, I feel something when yeah. looking at this. It's not just a picture of a baby in a crib. You know? Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and then the second one was like almost that I think a few months later, we you know had snowed and it was like our first snowfall. And I was just getting photos of her. And I was telling her to like throw snowballs at me. And for one of them, she threw it and I pressed the button and like my flash went off. Mm -hmm. And I got this moment where like the snow was coming towards me and it was like perfectly exposed and her face was just like so happy, but it had mm -hmm. this like 3D-ish effect and it was, you know, bokeh. Yeah. But looking back at it, I didn't know. And I was like, how did I do this? What, what happened here? How, you know, what happened? <laughs> what is this, this magic? Out. Yeah, what is this? This is cool. <laughs> and that was kind of like the moment where I, started to get hooked on yeah, it. Yeah, I love that. So you guys were, I feel like, a part of the first, would you say the first wave of uh, Instagram photographers? I'd say like second. Second Someone wave? the sophomore class. Okay, yeah. the sophomore class of the Instagram wave. And for people who aren't aware, um, I think I got on Instagram in 2011 when I was a junior in high school and I got my first iPhone. It, it used to not be on Android. So I remember one of the biggest reasons to get an iPhone was so I could do this Instagram thing. And mm. I remember when I got like 11 likes, I was like, oh, game over, amazing. Um, but when you logged on to Instagram, there was this thing called the suggested users, right? Mm. And I think that's how a lot of um, initial people who were either talented photographers or somehow were tight with Instagram people, you know, that was a very sought after thing. Mm. Um, were you guys a part of that? Or, cause I, I, I'm curious how, how was the sophomore class of these Instagram photographers? Like was suggested users, was that still as big of a deal? Uh, definitely helped, yeah. 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 So I think that in the early days, Instagram was very focused on this idea of community building. Yeah. And basically what a great way to do that is to find people who are using your platforms in uh, like unique and innovative ways and kind of um, offer them like a little support or like, you know, attention or mm -hmm. like, you know, we used to go in and talk to them about, how, you know, how we could how they could help us in our careers and do. Oh, all that wow. Stuff. I can't um, even get an email back from them. <laughs> yeah, not today. No. Not well, now. It's a, it's no. Nobody that worked there, including the founders. Yeah. Um, like really remains, I right, don't think. Right. So it's a completely different company now yeah. in my in my eyes. Yeah. Um, but in the early days, it was really this tight knit community of people. And I think that we got a lot of support because we were heavily invested in, you know, community building, which is something that we're still, you know, pretty mm -hmm. uh, interested in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that what was so great about the early days is like, you know, we could have, we'd host a meetup together and have 400, 500 Wow. people that were curious about photography and i remember those meetups i mean it would be a specific hashtag mm -hmm. and everyone would look forward to oh if that person's gonna hashtag this i mean they i mean they started just calling them insta insta meetups right was yeah. that like the official yeah and then everyone had their own hashtag and you know like the dallas insta meetup and stuff yeah, and i, I exactly. remember i was like oh and you would identify some you know specific photographers with that hashtag and it really was what you said focus on community in the beginning yes absolutely yeah. and i think that's what kind of attracted us to it very much so in the early days too it was like wow again like what happened as instagram came out and one of the reasons it's such a successful platform is it hit the perfect time where all of a sudden visual communication was becoming democratized mm -hmm. where like you had a camera by default if you right. had a smartphone right before you would have to go through a pretty tremendous amount of effort to be like dabble in photography. Mm -hmm. But when Instagram hit, it was like right when everybody got a camera by it was default. Perfect timing. Right. Yeah. And so then there's this huge group of people who are newly curious about visual art. Yeah. And then, it, you know, if we have a place where we can all get together and become friends and bond over this common interest, mm -hmm. then naturally like these friendships emerge and these groups of people emerge. And that was really kind of what defined the early days of, of this phenomenon. Yeah. Um, how did you, so that, that first community that y'all found, whether it was Instagram, what was that next step? Cause I'm sure in the beginning, um, were you guys in high school, college? I mean, were you focused on making a career out of photography or was this just, was this like a very pure, pure fun let's learn together experience yeah i think for me at first there was no 
given path to like, oh, if you do this, you'll get work out of it. I mean, right. I, I was either just out of college uh, or just started working. I was in education at the time. And for me, you know, I was passionate about photography for years before Instagram came out. Mm -hmm. uh, but up until then, it was a very solitary thing. You know, I would, I would go take photos on my own. And like Dave said, uh, during the beginning days, I would see people hanging out and taking photos together. And I was like, whoa, this is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You know, people are getting together and sharing knowledge. And I, I was very- Which was new that. back then, right? Yes. Like you want to keep your secrets a little bit closer to the chest because that means if I share this, then that person's going to be like, be a photographer too. And then that's less work for me, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I think the magic of those early days was we, we all didn't know that it would lead to anything past just getting together and like, you know, getting to know someone else and being creative together and pursuing this new interest in visual arts. And mm -hmm. a lot of us, for a lot of us, it was just kind of like an outlet. Right. Uh, it, it wasn't like a defined thing where like oh if we do this then we might get photo work i think right. it was just like yeah. that was the purity of it was pursuing it for the passion right yeah i'd love to i'd love to say something too about mm -hmm. uh collaboration versus competition um we found kind of i think we kind of fell into a group of people that were super interested in collaboration mm -hmm. So like, you know, my earliest models when I was getting super deep into this stuff were other photographers and, mm -hmm. and you know, sharing um, techniques and equipment and, and like we kind of just naturally were extremely collaborative mm -hmm. in, uh, in a way that was very new to me. And I, I really embrace that and love it. Um, and I think that the misconception about creative work is that there's like a limited amount of space for, for this work to live. Y'all, there's room. And there's so much room. Come the, help us, actually. Yeah. And <laughs> one of the reasons there's so much room is because the same device that, that has democratized visual art, which is these smartphones, mm -hmm. it's also a display. And that, that little display in your pocket represents an infinite amount of real estate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the demand for visual art and photography, graphic design, video work is vastly outpacing the supply of mm -hmm. people that are interested in creative work. So, of course, you know, there's more photographers and, and artists than ever before because they have access, but actually the places where this stuff can live are outpacing that even mm -hmm. so. So if you look at a classic like supply and demand of any industry, it's a really great time to be a creative yeah. person. Oh, wonderful. And we hit this cool window where we got the opportunity to not have to you know, be cutthroat and compete. And so we definitely have an ethos of like, mm -hmm. it's all about helping each other, working together and uh, that, has gotten me so much further than like closing myself off to the to the people that I could have considered competitors. One hundred percent. It's the rising tide raises all ships or whatever. I really need to get my uh, sayings down because I reference the same ones a lot, but I can never get it perfectly. But that's so true, especially in. Um, I feel like I'm in this little tech YouTube bubble where everyone's so nice. And I feel like everyone there's ups and downs, of course, but everyone's kind of thriving because we collaborate with each other. It's very nice. There's like no drama, but then the, if you go over to makeup YouTube or maybe vlogging YouTube or family vloggers YouTube, it's crazy how cutthroat some industries can get. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like when you can find those genuine relationships and all of you guys understand that, it really is a magical thing. It's like a really special thing to be a part of um, because something that I've learned with sharing expertise or whatever it is, 95% um, of people aren't going to go do it. Like it is very hard, even if it's with your iPhone to get really good at iPhone photography, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So it's like really the sharing is exciting because it's for those 5% of people who are actually going to take that and go do it, which yeah. is which is really fun. And to me, that also reminds me, one of the ways I think about this stuff is there's never, I, th I think of photography as a visual language yeah. and no one is completely fluent. Like there's always more to learn. Yeah. And then as you're learning, the technology is changing. The needs are changing. The world is changing. It keeps you on your toes. Yeah. And yeah. so like, you know, it's the people who are constantly putting the work in and developing and evolving mm -hmm. that are going to be leading the pack because, you know, if you, every time you iterate, you're creating something new and, and yeah. exciting and defining the, the very industry that you're working in. Totally. 
um I feel like people will be mad if I if I don't upfront ask the gear that you guys use before we start getting into the nitty gritty photography. Um, we we all met. I feel like Sony Alpha. Were you on the Cuba trip? I don't think you were, no, right? So not. David was just you. I met you and like a whole squad of Sony shoot shooters. Um, where did we first meet? Was it Hustle and Why? Like one of the events or? Yeah, I think it was Hustle and Why. Yeah, yeah, with and like German yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and very we cool. Out of random festivals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. I was at the for the Honda Civic thing. Yeah, that was fun. Um, and so we have the the Sony commonality. Are you mm -hmm. guys still shooting Sony? What what are your go tos? Uh, yeah, I'm still Team Sony. Mm -hmm. I use a Sony A7 III and a A7 R3. Nice for most of my photo work and any video stuff that I've done. I, that's kind of what I've used as well. Cool. And just an array of Sony lenses. Favorite lens? What's your go to? uh lately the 135 18 actually oh yeah, yeah. very nice so yeah, really you're good. saying you would leave the house with only the 135 to go shoot street stuff lately yes just because wow. it's, it's such a different focal length than, yeah. than what i'm used to and kind yeah. of all the images that i get out of it are so cinematic and just have this like incredible depth to them that i, I just yeah. really really love love it uh, before that, I would say the 35 1.4 yeah. was like my go-to yeah. for okay, like I everything. That one. That's the only lens that has ever made taking pictures for me fun. Because usually I'm just 100% video, but whenever I have that on, maybe it's something to do with like a prime and you don't have, yeah. it just simplifies things, yeah. you know, and you just, that lens is just so fun. It's I love that lens. Beautiful yeah. lens. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful lens. Um, yeah, I'm also uh, Team Sony for sure. Um, I'm in the Alpha Collective with, with mm -hmm. Jose. Um, but it's funny to be talking here with, with Jose in the room because he is really the one that like even got me interested in Sony. Very interesting. Um, Were you Canon before? I was actually Nikon. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. But I kept running into this problem. <laughs> Nikon. I haven't yeah. heard them in a while. I had a D800. <laughs> nice. But, uh, so Silva started doing, what were you shooting with the? What was it called? The Q? So I started, I did a project with Sony on the QX100. Okay. Which is a short lived. I don't even know what Yeah, it was what a very short lived, and, but it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So it wasn't a camera per se, it was a lens that had its own sensor. What's it called? QX100. Okay. It had a 20 megapixel sensor that also shot raw, and it was a Zeiss lens. And you would connect it to your phone and use the phone. Wow, yeah. It would literally clip onto your phone. <laughs> yeah. Turn your phone into like a DSLR. And or not, yeah. or a mirrorless rather. Wow. Yeah, and it was like super early on in the game, so. Yeah, like 2013. Yeah, so it was like having a DSLR, but you could just carry it, you know, as, as a small little lens. That was also a Zeiss lens that used your phone as a means as of, like the as a display yeah. yeah so hashtag iphone photography but uh but souped up <laughs> yeah. and then, well so also at the kind. time you couldn't upload uh dslr images to instagram and i this totally thing somehow forgot about bypassed that. it yeah this thing somehow bypassed it so you wow. can so anyhow i did a project with uh sony for the qx100 and I, I taught a class at their store a workshop on how to use it and you know i was in education so yeah. they saw that i did a really good job or you know I, I put a very detailed uh workshop on how to use this thing and after that they were like hey we're like super interested in you know maybe sending you some other stuff to try out mm -hmm. and this was around the time that the first a7r came out and i remember i was like hey like i have my whole gear set up i'm like i don't know if i want to try this new mirrorless thing out yeah but they're like no just like we'll send it to you <laughs> and you know give you you know just give us your thoughts yeah. And I remember they sent it to me and I took it to Vegas because I had a, a job coming up and had a, I did a helicopter flight. And I was like, you know, I'll use this A7R. Let's try it out. And it was 36 megapixels, which at the mm. time was unbelievable to me. Yeah, seriously. And I remember just seeing those images and just like how, how much there was the resolution. And I was like, whoa, this is cool. That was the first A7R, 36 mm -hmm. megapixels. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And oh, wait, are you about the R? Yeah, A7R, okay, the okay. first A7R. Okay. Uh, and, but at the same time, there were a lot of things that I didn't quite love about the camera. Right. So I you wrote them and I was the like, all the time. I was like, you know, the, yeah, mm -hmm. dust in the <laughs> sensor, the shutter was way too loud. It was yeah. heavy, it was clunky, uh, you know, some problems in autofocus. But anyhow, I wrote this whole thing and I was like, hey, here's what I don't like. Mm -hmm. And Sony was super into that. They were like, oh yeah, like <laughs> give us more, <laughs> you know, what, what else don't you like, <laughs> you know? And that started like a really cool relationship where you know I, I was just giving them a lot of feedback yeah. and we started working together 
And I wonder if they're sick at that by, because uh, I always get asked, you know, for those feedback meetings. Yeah. And it's gotten pretty brutal where I'm like, guys, listen, where the hell is the Sony A7S III? Yeah. Like, what is going on? Yeah. And I, I kind of got, yeah, I no longer get invited. <laughs> <laughs> I've always found them to be like, actually, for a, the size of the company and, and how much is going on with them, like, in, they're, we're incredibly responsive to a lot yeah. of our feedback. Yeah. Like, like, we got into this whole thing with them about we wanted a joystick on the back of the, yeah. the camera oh, for the was focus that, point. Was that you guys? I mean, I said it. I know, I know, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know, like, uh, uh, Sal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sal, awesome. Sal Dialia, shout out to him. He was, he's like great at giving them good feedback and yeah. they actually listen and they're like, very receptive it'll, yeah. it'll come like the new camera will come out and i'm like whoa like, <laughs> it's magic yeah well, it's really yeah. crazy to see you know something that you kind of worked for or you asked them for it to be implemented mm -hmm. into a camera and is you know a camera is kind of just such a tool for our creativity mm -hmm. to see such a large company taking any of our feedback yeah. and putting it into their products and to just feel mind -blowing. yeah to yeah. feel heard period exactly. is very unique let me let me finish my yes yes my sony kit yeah so i have the i, I started shooting sony because i would go out and meet up with Jose and he'd be like, dude, this camera is like so small and amazing yeah. and powerful. And I have this big, doing? huge, like paperweight. <laughs> <laughs> and like, it was such a good shift for me that it's amazing what I was, what I take for granted now. Right. One of the things is like the electronic viewfinder. Like when you look through that lens, it's like augmented reality on top of the world, mm -hmm. right? So when you look through a DSLR, you're just getting reflected light off a mirror. That's it. You don't see what your image is going to look like. You don't even know what exposure, yeah. like without. It's wild to think about meter. that. Yeah. Like my Canon T3, I know autofocus, optical viewfinder. Yeah. That was the dark age. Yeah, exactly. And, but the reason I switched is because I inherited all this legacy glass from my grandfather mm -hmm. and my father. And so I was actually taking apart Leica lenses, rebuilding them just so they could fit the Nikon F mount. Wow. But hmm. then I started looking into, okay, how do I use all these these lenses and I spoke to a guy named um, Jeffrey Berliner. He, yeah, he's awesome photographer. He runs the Penumbra Foundation in New York, which is something everybody, every photographer should know about. It's like, it's uh, dedicated to preserving traditional photography techniques and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I brought him these lenses and I said, you know, I'm rebuilding these lenses. I don't want to actually modify them. And he goes, oh, you should, uh, you know, think about the mirrorless systems. Mm. And then so I looked into all the different mirrorless systems distance, and talked to Jose yeah. and, and he showed me all the features and I was immediately hooked. So mm. with a very th cheap, thin adapter, I could use these like beautiful Leica mm. M mounts with That's this so augmented exciting. reality system. You know what's so crazy, Dave? I haven't I haven't talked to you since in the recent year. My grandpa gave me all of his Leicas. Oh my and God, it's literally like it wasn't I'll it, take them, thank you. It, yeah, so of, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, um, unfortunately, you know, it wasn't like a Leica M6. It wasn't the M system, but um, he literally had like the OG Leica 2, yeah. which, you know, the the lenses like pop out. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the correct terminology for that. So he had those. Um, he, mm -hmm. he had the Leica R6. Um, so he had all this R, gla R lenses. R lenses. Um, and so it's been super fun to dive down that rabbit hole. Yeah. And, you know, like my parents just recently scanned in all of his old film pictures. Oh, and it. so this past year has been such a fun experience for me personally, because I've never, again, being around you guys is why I've never even ever called myself any type of photographer <laughs> um, but it's been so fun to see through another person's lens of like their life and their cameras and i got into film and you know adapted the r lenses to the new leica sl2 and that yeah. was so fun to do and then i got hooked on the leica q2 and i'm like well i just need to buy that now yeah. i just it was so fun to what's use what's so fun about the legacy glass is like if you have the newest uh 24 to 70 whatever from sony like that's the exact same optics as 99% of the people that are buying that system, right? Yeah. Cause they're all, these are mass produced mm -hmm. manufactured lenses. So if you're able to introduce um, some sort of variable, like maybe a, a, a lens that way less people have, yeah. you kind of automatically get a different lens signature. It renders color differently. Um, even like I shoot a lot of rain and like the old glass, like the way it picks up the droplets of rain is mm -hmm. completely different than the newer 
glass, which is a lot more, you know, a lot sharper, a lot more yeah. perfected. Right. But there's this beautiful like patina mm. to these older lenses and you can completely like develop your unique style just by building mm -hmm. your little like Frankenstein monster oh, totally. the camera. I love it. Well, because I remember in Cuba, you had that Noctilux. Yeah, and I still, that's my favorite oh, lens. Oh my God. So to answer that question, my favorite lens is, <sighs> is the 50 millimeter 1.0 uh, Noctilux wow. that I yeah. that my grandfather bought and gave to my dad. 1.0, guys. And gave it to me. <laughs> Talk about depth of field. Oh, it sees at night. And I, when you pair that with- uh, Sony? Yeah, Sony that can shoot up to like, easily up to like, you know, yeah. this guy takes it up to the 20,000s. I- I Savage. personally <laughs> try to limit myself to like 6,400, <laughs> but yeah. F1, like I can literally shoot with one mm -hmm. candle as the lighting source. Wow. So it's really fun. Yeah, no, that's so fun. Um, and in terms of, cause you know, you talked to developing a style, you guys have done a variety of photography. Um, and Jose, I love your, your music photography specifically. It's so cool when there's so many photographers shooting one concert right but then oh you just get that one image that, oh wow that was from that same show that's really cool looking um so in a in a space that traditionally it has been pretty not crowded but you know that's a thing that people do take pictures of people on stage what was your attitude um towards that and like okay how can i make my picture stand out were there things that you did in the beginning to challenge yourself or was it just going to festival after festival after festival <laughs> Yeah, I think the difference, thank you so much for the yeah, comment, by the way. I think the difference that I can perceive between my photography is that I'm, I'm actually a big fan of a lot of the music that I shoot and I, yeah. I listen to a ton of music. And whenever, you know, a, a person asks me, oh, how can I become better at music photography? So, you know, get to know the music that you'll be shooting. Like anytime I go to shoot a festival, first thing I do is if there are any artists that I don't know on the on the bill, I'll, I'll go and listen to them. Mm -hmm. And there are so many more things you can kind of anticipate when you know a song and you know when the drop is coming and you know the moment's gonna come and there's you know a big crescendo or something and you know that the artist is gonna do something cool, then you'll be ready for it. And otherwise it's, the one thing that I really love about music photography, it's, it's not only about how prepared you are, but there's also a lot of luck involved because you know the lighting is always moving around, the artist is always moving around. You never know what's what's gonna happen, so you kind of have to really be on your toes. And like you said, sometimes there'll be 50 people in the pit, and you're all trying to like move around and get that perfect angle. But you know the artist will choose one side, yeah. and and you're like, oh, I didn't <laughs> and you go might there. just be screwed, yeah. And then you know you might have the wrong lens on. So yeah. there's a lot of elements that come together. Uh, that I think a lot of people don't really think about when looking at music photography. Yeah. Uh, but if there is any moment where I can translate, you know, their artistry into a single image, mm -hmm. then that to me is, you know, like my job well done. So okay. I just try to match the intensity of, of their, their art to what I'm creating mm -hmm. uh, at the moment. And I think being a big fan of the music is a part of it. Are you someone when you're in those situations, do you kind of spray and pray or are you someone who literally just is still taking single pictures and you wait for the moment or do you are you in like are you shooting you know the 15 frames per second or how it depends how on the can, artist and, yeah. and the festival and kind of like my mood going in there are people who are just way more active and you never know what's going to happen so yeah. for example like a, a travis scott mm -hmm. you know he's going to come out and he's going to jump and there's going to be pyro and there's going to be <laughs> smoke and you never yeah. know you know so for those kind of in in instances you kind of want to just shoot as much as you can and yeah. review later and how many uh, the A7R4, is that what we're using, or three? Or three. Or three. How many pictures can that take per second oh, I'm without not sure. blacking out? Three, maybe? Uh, 30? No, the R3 stops at like, isn't it 11 or 12? No, it's more than that. More than that? Yeah. 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 It's it's a little so more. It's I say decent. Yeah. yeah, no, it's good. It's, it's never like so failed me. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> no. It's I, I will say this, the, the A9, I shot with the A9 oh, the for A9 a bunch of festivals insane. and having the no blackout was a game changer at mm -hmm. the time it was crazy to just not you know not see the shutter and continuously see yeah. what is what is going on oh, totally. that was really really cool so can i say something about the way you shoot shows yeah, oh, yeah. so let me hear one of the one of the things i love about your style and how you do get these unique shots is like you're not somebody who's married to the pit because you're so like into the music yeah that you actually like you're not like, oh, I'm going here to shoot. You're like, I'm going to a show and I'm going to come out with some beautiful images. Yeah. So like, you'll be in the back, you'll be in the dead center of the crowd. You don't like just take it as an opportunity to make photos. You take it as an immersive opportunity to like 
be in the music. And I think that's really reflected in your work. Yeah, I love that. Because you get different angles than like the typical person that's just snapping away and, and like solely focused on, on yeah. the image. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And I think that also goes back to just being a fan of, of the music and being passionate about it. You know, a lot of the photographers I know, they'll be in the pit for, you know, one, two songs. and be like, oh, I got my shot. And, yeah. You know, they'll go edit right away because for a lot of these festivals, it's kind of like not the best photo to get to, to them first because they need right. to go out. Right. And a lot of the times I'm like, yeah, but I'm really here to enjoy this set, you know, so yeah. I'm like. I'll shoot, I'll get in the crowd. And then when the crowd sees you as a photographer that you're like vibing with the music, and you yeah. know the lyrics too. And you know, then, then you're just kind of like one of them. And you're like, oh wow, this guy's really cool. So a lot of times it'll like make more way for me to right. get in between mm -hmm. them. Or have, have you guys ever had the issue of an artist using your picture or a model using your picture <laughs> and like not tagging? Oh, all the time. <laughs> and like how- That's what I had for breakfast. Like <laughs> today, yeah. <laughs> happened just now <laughs> like what is i mean i understand like if someone pays you your rate to take pictures like that's their picture they paid for it but there's so many instances where it is like oh you didn't pay for that or oh this was a favor or oh this is kind of what's expected and then it so uh, asking i guess it's very common so you you kind of i guess what just move on with it's, your life or how how do you handle i feel like at a certain point the stress that comes from worrying about that stuff right. far overweighs the, you know, that's a good way to look but, at but it, a lot yeah. of times it's like, you know, some really big artists, you know, they, if they tagged you, that could yeah. give you a lot of opportunities, yeah. you know? So it, it's kind of sucks when that happens, but I kind of just roll with the punches and yeah. you know, I'm here to make the art and just keep going. Definitely. Yeah. To me, anytime, anytime new technology emerges, there's new etiquette. Mm. Right. And, and a lot of times, if, especially like the more famous somebody is, they're separated from you by many layers of publicists and uh, agencies and the like the flow, the content flow is like very complex. Mm -hmm. no, so by true. the time they get it, they don't, you know, a lot of times they don't even know who shot it. Yeah. And, and my favorite type of people of, you know, of celebrity note are the ones who will are willing to correct that effort. error. Or right. like, or if they, you know, if they post something and there's no credit and a bunch of like, you know, if, if somebody posted one of his photos, he has a, a very loyal base of people who love his work that would right. be like, hey, spam, spam, spam. <laughs> yeah, yeah this, this is Jose's photo. And yeah, a lot of those artists it. will like good on them. They'll be like, That's it's awesome. so easy to just edit and put yeah. it in there. Um, so I think, yeah, anytime there's there's new technology, there's new etiquette. And it's like the community kind of defines what is the right thing to do right. for us. I, I try to tag everybody involved to, like to a reasonable degree. Yeah. Like, I always want people getting their credit. Like if someone's doing makeup for one of my shoots, I want other people to know who did that makeup. Mm -hmm. And that's goes back a little bit to that, you know, let's work together, not mm -hmm. uh let's not work in isolation and try to like, you know, step on each other to get to the top. Totally. Let's let's share knowledge, share information. Yeah. There's more power in numbers yeah. together. So. 100%. Dave, one of like my favorite genre of your pictures are maybe it's because I love New York. But again, it's you out there, rainy vibes, New mm. York, misty, rainy. It's just vibes. Yeah. Like when I, it's vibes. Um, <laughs> and do you, in terms of like genres of your photography, um, there's this weird separation and I feel it all the time where it's like doing it for the art and then, oh, I need to like pay bills, right? Is, and I've seen you kind of like, fuse those those things and that i saw that like vibey razor ad you did oh yeah like that was sick that Thanks. was sick so how do you how do you balance that because sometimes those pictures that make people follow you that make oh my gosh that is so unique hmm. that's sometimes not necessarily what people are paying for right how have you kind of um yeah found that balance and then are those conversations you have with brands of like listen this is my style of picture yes if you want that product, it's going to have to be in there my way. Right. So I used to work in internally in an agency, BBDO, and I loved that job. It was awesome. It gave me a really good understanding of, of the brand side and yeah. the client and, and the agency side of things, like the, what conversations are happening in those rooms, um, you know, what, what the client is looking for. Mm -hmm. So when I was able to make the leap to freelance, like more on the you know personal creative side, I had a huge advantage of knowing how to talk to clients, right. what they're looking for, how to explain my vision in a way that like what I tell younger creatives and people like trying to break into the industry is like everybody has a job to do. If you can make their job easier, 
like they are going to come back again and again and again because everybody wants a little bit off their plate. So for me, if I come with a more of a, a creative vision, like for the the uh, razor ad that you're speaking of, mm. you know, it's less work on, for them. On the first yeah. call, I'm already like, here's what I'm, here's what I'm thinking, here's yeah. what I want to do, and they're like, oh great, well you know, like as long as that touches on our brief, then you know we trust you. And the other advantage is is that I work for myself and. Um, when you're treated, when you're an outside entity, like you get a lot more, in my experience, creative control. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an agency, there's a whole system that's working, right? And you have to be like a part of that. You know, you're you're a cog in a much bigger machine. So you get a lot less say about what the machine is going to do. But when you're an independent creative and, and a brand has come to you because they want access to your audience, like you, you're the person that they're going to trust to say, here's what's going to work for this project. Mm -hmm. So I, that being said, I, I get a tremendous amount of creative freedom. And that's something I'm really grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of making sure that my commercial work and my personal work can kind of live side by side, I think that's a very interesting line to tread. But the way I try to do it is like, I have an overall, I've spent years and years and years developing this aesthetic, right? And it's very, again, it's very like dark mode, mm -hmm. like um, neon lights, rain, weather, um, just like, uh, very cinematic looking yeah. and that's just a layer that I can I can really add to almost anything like you know I shoot I did a cup you know a half year's worth of content for Honda social media and it's like they let me play with that you know we yeah. we took a um, we took a car and like drove it down a Brooklyn street that had a you know the f uh, fire hydrant spraying all over mm. and, like people running wow. through it and so that created this like environment of rain that i'm because of my personal work exploring street photography right. i know exactly what to do in that yeah. scenario to make those drops like pop out and stand you know we have the headlight shining through it mm -hmm. and you can create these cinematic moments the reason i love my personal work and my street photography is because it's like improv jazz or something mm -hmm. right you go you're thrown out into a situation where you, you have, never know what you're gonna get you have all these yeah. over overlapping variables and a decisive moment is kind of lies at the confluence of these different variables. Mm -hmm. And how can you, with your eye, kind of pinpoint down this intersection of, of variables in a way that is visually compelling and tells a story. Mm -hmm. And so every time I'm doing street photography, I'm just doing that for fun. Yeah. So by the time I get into a shoot and there's all this stuff going on and all these variables coming up, you know, it's like You're freestyling, ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're yeah. ready for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jose, you've worked with people like Samsung and where that, again, blurs those lines of um, photographer and, oh, let's just see it, guys, influencer, right? It's for some reason we hate that word, but you guys are influencers and also photographers. Um, I would say photographers first. Um, that's very clear. Again, guys, if you haven't checked out their Instagram yet, check it out. Um, but your recent work with Samsung was really cool. And um you know, you showed off a phone, but also you're out there shooting really great pictures. And I am curious the whether it's like a percentage or how these things come to you guys. Uh, where is it influencer first? Is it, hey, we want we need these images on your Instagram. How do we get there? Or is it we love your images? Can you shoot for our bigger campaign? Can we use it on our socials? Can we use it here? But also can you post it to your socials? How break that down for me? Yeah, I think it's changed a, a lot over time, and I think for Dave and I both, at first, you know, once our numbers became inflated or whatever you you want to say on Instagram, you know, all the brands were like, "Yeah, can you post for us? Can you post? Can mm -hmm. you post? Share this!" And you know, they give you all the metrics of how many times and how many things. And at <laughs> first, you know, it was early in the day, so I was like. You want to pay me to post on my Instagram? Like, what? yeah, this yeah. is insane. My very <laughs> what is first this? Yeah, gig, sure. <laughs> my very first, whatever you want. Yeah, my very first paid gig was for Cartoon Network, and it was what? yeah, it was Rick and Morty. Oh, for that's the, such a good wow, for the premiere that's good. for the premiere <laughs> show ever. Yeah, for the premiere of Rick and Morty, they did an wow. installation right next to the flat uh, flat iron. And it was like a spaceship had landed and it was Rick and Morty. And I was like, crash. Oh, what? A show? Right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. sure. Dave's like, I was there. I was a fan. <laughs> I, just, I just know the, the universe of Rick and Morty. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think they probably crashed. Mm, yeah. 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 Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and, you know, a, an agency contacted me and like, oh, yeah, well, you have to do a show up, take a photo with your phone and post it on your Instagram and say Rick and Morty coming, you know, yeah. coming out this Monday. And I was like, wait, what? You're going to pay me to post on Instagram? <laughs> like I triple checked 
And I remember, you know, I, I did it. I went and I tried to make it as cool as possible. And I posted it. And this was the biggest lie I've ever been told in my whole career was uh -huh. like, I posted it and someone from the agency came down. They were like, oh, let me see the post. And I showed him. He's like, all right, I'll be right back. And then he left. And then he came back like 10 minutes later with a check. And I was like, whoa, I posted it. And I got paid right away. This is the best thing in the world. Oh, that, that the is lie. so not That's normal. A, yeah, it was uh, never the happened fact again. That, that was your first interaction with <laughs> yeah. that is hilarious. Yeah, shout out to uh, Mobile Media Lab. That was oh, oh, my. Wow. And for some context, guys. <laughs> I, I've gotten paid. I've had to sue. I've had to sue. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, this German uh, agency to get paid for something that was literally a year and a half ago, and mm -hmm. I just got paid the final check. They they did it in uh, segments. Oh my gosh. Because they they weren't liquid. They were literally a funded startup, and so they were using all of the money that they guaranteed to pay the YouTubers with um, for their own, like to pay their employees and stuff. Right. So yeah yeah it's a mess out there it's it's a mess out there so that's amazing yeah. that not only like rick and morty but also you got, got paid, paid right on away. the spot i just i just signed a deal <laughs> that has uh my payment is net 90. Oh, yeah. and i like tried to negotiate and i was like but it's it's a it's at a, least they're being honest now <laughs> i was like i'm like okay so like i'll you're gonna send me a check this summer like and i'm doing it now like okay it's crazy that's the crazy part about being a freelancer you yeah know? You, you can't really um you don't have the ability to control necessarily like the pacing of your mm -hmm. of your income sometimes yeah. yeah the craziest thing to me is the disparity between when you're working and, and when they come at you with the brief and they're like well you know you have to be yeah. there tomorrow and you have 30 <laughs> minutes to shoot and then you have to give us the images two minutes later and we need to be copyrighted and need to be out because it's a very urgent manner and you're like oh yes 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 i will make it work i will do all of these things right on time and then as soon as you do it they just disappear and then you're like hey i've done my part yeah. like who what sorry oh sorry we oh, have to new, send this. new email who's this <laughs> yeah we have to send this through processing to get to accounting to get to our business department yeah right and it's always the, it's, the it's so one. fast on your end yeah. but yeah. then when it comes time to pay it's like oh what the number one quote that i every single time i follow up especially on the ones that are like net 60 or net yeah. 90 yeah. which are ridiculous in my mind but yeah. the number one thing is like oh i you know what we just followed up with the counting. There was some mistake. Oh, yeah. it's, it checks in the mail. <laughs> Always a mistake. I'm like, oh my God, I want to put something in my contract. It's like, if I have to remind you to pay me, I need a 50% increase. <laughs> exactly. There's all these things in contracts that it, anytime I, you know, complain about it, I try not to. Yeah. But anytime I put something on social media, you get all the people that come through with the contracts and they're like, here, and then you had this and you had that and you had this. I'm like, oh. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Lawyer. Well, do you, do you guys work with, uh, like, do you have a lawyer who checks contracts and stuff, or do you do you guys go through it on your own? I <laughs> mostly just do everything on my own. Yeah. I even manage myself, um, which I'm kind of unmanageable. So <laughs> I'm just shaking my head. Yeah. I just we're. If you want a good example of what how not to do this, it's us too. Business wise. But, <laughs> business wise. But the legal side, but I think that just frees up more time for the creative side. Yeah, totally. Um, I think you and I could both be a little more responsible on that end, but we also, you know, are kind of like tornado of creativity spiraling no, yeah. through the world has totally. gotten us yeah. to some really cool, interesting places together. Yeah. So. Tasmanian devil of yeah, exactly. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So there's a little bit of controlled chaos um, that is like the fuel for my creativity. Yeah. Okay, but going back to how this whole thing started, so I think at first. A lot of companies were coming to us like, yeah, post on your channel, post on your channel, post uh -huh. on your channel. And over time, as our like creative identities kind of solidified and we, you know, came more uh, into our own, we started making a lot more of a collaborative effort where we're like, hey, you know, maybe w this is how we want to showcase or maybe we want to work to make your brand better and maybe yeah. shoot for you to you can to license post it on these your, images yeah, to and, post it on your channels. Yeah. And then that turned into more like creative consulting. And you're like, how can, you know? We help you come across as a more genuine, you know, brand. And how, how how can you empower creatives in a in a better way, you know, without making it seem like you're taking advantage of them to just be like, hey, influence, go influence. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah it, there's definitely a big shift. Um, I think as Instagram, well, when Instagram got bought by Facebook, that basically gave them an incredible uh, safety net and also like a huge boon of resources and, and security. Uh, meaning that like brands were finally able to, to invest 
you know, a lot more of their budgets and their interests into Instagram specifically. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, I think it did open up the doors for us in terms of, well, who are you, okay, if you're a big major brand, who are you gonna go to to make uh, work that thrives on Instagram? Right. Like probably the people who are making work and thriving on Instagram. Right, right. So it's kind of like platform centric work. And they started, you know, the deals became, oh, you know, you'll post and we'll pay you, but the the meat of the of the contracts now is a lot more like we want to license your work that's awesome. for us. No, that's great. And that actually pays for me, it pays a lot better. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's also just more authentic to what I want to do. Yeah. I've never been the type to be like, um, hey, like, you know, just like again, you said that the word influencer, mm -hmm. and it's like there's such a <laughs> connotation to that Cringe. word. <laughs> But it's like, I've always tried to think of a better way to describe what we do. But it's I'm like, um, a content creator. Yeah, but even that, like, con so <laughs> I have a problem content, with the word yeah. content because content is like. um, Like, what is it? It's just too big of a bucket. Like yeah. everything fits into it, right? Yeah. Content is literally anything. There's yeah. content everywhere. So if you say you're a content creator, it's like being like if you're a doc, it's like being a really incredible surgeon and be like, I work in medicine. I work in medicine, yeah. And it's like, okay, but like, we're not really having a conversation yet. Yeah. So yeah. like, what do you do? Yeah. And it's like, oh. I'm, I'm so grateful being a YouTuber is cool now because now I'll just say YouTuber. But before I was like, I'm a filmmaker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm not. I do wedding films in the mm -hmm. beginning. You but know? also, you know, we've, we have, we've had words for what we're doing for centuries. I mean, yeah. we're, we consider ourselves artists. Yeah. And we were artists with followings, and I just wish I could yeah. smash that into some artists with word followings that, that would yes. stick. And and if you <sighs> think about it, we, I don't know how it was back in the day with Picasso and stuff, but things are changing at such a rate where we, I feel like we have to even be more flexible with our art, whatever that is, because not only is the actual art of it changing, but the platforms are and mm -hmm. the mediums are actually changing and you have to be very flexible to that. And so I am curious, as we were talking about earlier, how you were, y'all were the cool kids in the beginning with Instagram, right? It's this new thing. I'm sure older photographers were like, screw this. What is this? You're sharing your work. You're, you're a part of this. Like you're telling them your secrets, how to, no, screw that. You guys embraced it. Um, and now we've come into, there's a whole new wave of social media sites right and there's youtube and twitter and tiktok and all of these things how how have you guys maybe evolved as instagram has involved and are you curious about these other platforms yeah absolutely um i mean change is the only constant mm -hmm. right so none of this stuff is permanent um and i think the key is is to be open-minded and be flexible because I I do know photographers that were like very well established photographers that in principle hated what Instagram was all about because mm -hmm. it was this kind of like, you know, once you put the work in and you made it past the gatekeepers and you become like a published famous photographer, the idea that you could reach more people by right, giving right. it away for free is like an, the antithesis of what you've, you've worked learned for, yeah. and worked for. Um, and I think that there's a tendency, um, and I even feel it in myself to like look at the new waves of content coming up and, and laughing it off as not, you know, oh, this isn't, this is just uh, clickbaity or like it's too. Them it's, youngsters out there. Yeah, but I always try to remember <laughs> how I felt, you know, with, an, with access to a new platform right. and to have the gatekeepers removed and being able to be in control of, of my own distribution network, which mm -hmm. gave me a career and my creative freedom. So, I salute the people doing, you know, thriving on these new platforms. And I just hope that I can like figure out something that works for me where I don't like make myself irrelevant by being unwilling to evolve. Right, right. Jose, you said you're getting into music more, you know, you love music and you're getting more into the, the artistic side of that. How's that going? What does that mean? Are you learning Pro Tools, Logic? Do you have a little? It's, yeah, so it's uh, learning Logic Nitty. and Ableton and all of the software that comes with it. But more so, I'm trying to start at the very, very basic roots and really going in for like music theory and the history of music and taking music courses. And just, I feel like if I can, you know, learn just the, the, the basics of the music, I can appreciate it better. And it's such a big part of my life. Like literally from the moment I wake up, 
I'm like, okay, what am I going to listen to right now? That's awesome. You know, and I just put music on. If it's not in my house, it's in my headphones. Who are some of your favorite artists? Of all time? All time. Uh, George Harrison is like my mm. idol forever and ever. My style icon too. I try to look like him all day, every day. <laughs> I see it. I see it. Thanks. <laughs> it means a lot. Uh, but yeah, George Harrison is, is a big influence for sure. Uh, recently, Tim and Paula, their new record just came out. Kevin Parker, I think, is a genius, genius artist. Uh, Michael Kiwanuka is an, another incredible artist who I've been listening to a ton recently, of all time. I mean, ah, there's so many. I just I, so many. Do you listen to? Um, how do I say this without sounding so old? Like the SoundCloud rap generation. Mm -hmm. Like, did you get into them at all? I mean, it's definitely matured now. Um, I mean, all of these guys are. Mainstream. Yeah, I'm always listening to pretty much like music from every angle. And yeah. there were a lot of uh, rappers. I'm not so much into a lot of the newer, like trappier sounds. I mm -hmm. do listen to it. And like, I think there's a time and a place for it. And yeah. like you put on Roddy Rich in mm -hmm. the right place and people going crazy. <laughs> and like, yeah. you know, it's something different when you're immersed in the crowd and they're performing. You see it, the, the impact that it has on people. So, you know, yeah. I can respect it if it's not for me, but I can still respect the, the artistry behind it. Uh, but yeah, I'm a big fan of them. I'm, yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big, big fan of everything. When um, you, when you approached music to learn more about of it, uh, more about it, did you already have an end game in your brain on how to make money on it? Cause I, I think it's so <laughs> when we're like professional creators, I feel like I can't have a hobby like, okay, I love making videos, right? I still love, yeah, I still love making videos. And if I have another creative pursuit, I feel like automatically it's like, okay, well, how am I gonna monetize this, right? Yeah. Do you already have the game plan or, or do you find peace in, hey, this is gonna be my hobby for a little bit? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. For me, music has just been a long-term thing to think about just because, you know, over the past few years, I was like, well, if I start music now, like, when will I be any sort of decent? And there's such a threshold between where I want to be and where I am. Yeah. And now it's like, you know, if in 20 years I can make one cool song, <laughs> I'll be happy with it. Yeah, I love but that. also for me, you know, I, I've been trying to get more into video. And my main thing, anytime I do any sort of video work, is getting the music to go with it. And like yeah. the royalty free stuff is so bad. Mm -hmm. So I can never get myself to make any sort of, you know, I'll piece together all these videos and I'm like, but the music is terrible. <laughs> I can't. Jose, do you want to buy my URL musichustle.com <laughs> for $10,000 and start your own music licensing website? Yeah. That's that was exactly, my dream five exactly years ago. <laughs> I'm I literally going with this music theory thing. So just there you go. Okay, good. <laughs> it's so funny. Literally, three episodes ago, it's it's full circle. I went through with another friend who does entrepreneurial stuff, all of the URLs that we own. Um, and literally five years ago when I lit, or five years plus, uh, freshman in college, I am so, okay. Um, it's weird when I realized that was longer than I thought. Um, I bought musichustle.com. It was, it was like $1,500. Mm -hmm. So I like sold off all my guitar equipment because I played electric guitar for like my yeah. entire life. I love music. And I was like, I'm gonna solve this problem. But I was literally a 19 year old, yeah. no connections big in the dreams. industry, <laughs> such big dreams. And it, it worked out fine. Um, but it's so funny because I, I think, or not funny, it's very serendipitous how music I think follows a lot of creators and it, it somehow always comes back, you know, oh, yeah. in, in really interesting ways. Um, but yeah, there's still, we still need good royalty free music. You know, they're trying out there with Epidemic and Artlist and all of them. Yeah, they're trying. We need more artists out there. More, yeah. more people making music. No, yeah. I, I think it's just so hard to make money off of it mm -hmm. that people get discouraged really easily. That's what happened to me. I was like, oh. well, I got too into the gear. I, I stopped practicing and I, I just had so many guitars and so many amps and pedals. And I was like, wait, when was the last time that I practiced? Right. <laughs> You yeah. know, yeah. Do, you, do you guys ever feel that with photography mm. or when it's your job? I guess you you practice enough, right? Well, I'm I'm very like uh, I'm just not I don't think either one of us are like that gear obsessed yeah. in any way. Like no, that's true. Yeah, I, I really I have a second Instagram account that I shoot for just as much and it's only with my iPhone. Wow. Okay. Um, and that is because like the number one question I get online, it started five years ago, uh, was, Hey, what, you know, I have a thousand, you use? I have a thousand dollars to my name, like in my whole life, like, should I buy the Canon rebel or the Fuji? I'm like, look, 
Yeah. It doesn't matter. And also what you're texting me on can do most of what you want to do, so especially true. to learn. Mm -hmm. I think that it's actually easier to learn shooting mobile than it is to shoot with mm -hmm. a comp complex mm -hmm. camera. It's the argument for film too. Yeah. You really learn to appreciate the basic things of framing it up right because you're not going to get a yeah. second chance. And right? photography is so much more about how you see things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the art of observation than it is about the newest gear. Right. So I just say to anybody trying to get, you know, into this stuff, like start with your phone, start small, like make sure you really love it. Yeah. Uh, find, you, you can even find your style. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I I don't get too caught up in the gear side of it. Mm -hmm. I do love like, you know, a good lens or something oh, yeah. like that. Good Noctilux, good uh, $10,000 lens, yeah, exactly. man. <laughs> I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just gear shoot on like a glass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's but good. no, I do really mean that like I've learned a tremendous amount about photography by limiting myself to my iPhone yeah. at, at times. With that, with everyone having phones and it being super saturated, I mean, honestly, the moment Instagram and the iPhone 6, that was kind of when I was like, oh, what the heck? Why is this so good? Um, a lot of people call themselves photographers now, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until I kind of found y'all's little pocket of photographers that I was like, holy smokes, I've said this four times already, but I was like, there is something unique. I don't know how to put my finger on it, but these are people who are bringing in their own perspective into their work. And so how, like for someone who's maybe been shooting on their iPhone for years and they love it, but maybe they're just having a hard time standing apart because it is so saturated, right? What's some advice that you would, you would give to them? Uh, the first piece of advice I would give is don't, don't fall into the trap of trying to please the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. shoot, yeah. don't shoot because, don't shoot for numbers. Mm -hmm. Because if you're shooting for numbers, you're gonna pigeonhole yourself into creating work and getting literally trapped in a cycle of making things you don't actually love. Mm -hmm. And that's defeating the purpose of a creative life. Yeah. A creative life for me, um, ideally should be, you are becoming more and more unequivocally yourself and attracting the people that like you for who you for who you are. Right. Yeah. And that's my goal. Like I don't it's very tempting to take that like super oversaturated sunset shot with mm -hmm. beautiful girl dead center in the yeah. middle like walking into the <laughs> distance and that's going to get a lot more likes because it's this is the first time we've ever really had pop photography right hmm. in the same way that we got pop music after electric hmm. instruments were yeah. demo more democratized and computers and you know so there is this strain of um of visual art that is extremely crowd pleasing but it's also the most generic rush to the middle mm -hmm. kind of game mm -hmm. and it's a really good way to get numbers but then you're stuck making this kind of like sugar-coated right. um unrealistic like I always look at those pictures. I'm like, what is this a picture of? Yeah. It looks like it's a picture of color or, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's a cool way to learn about specific techniques. Maybe right, if you're right. like, oh, like look at all this crazy bokeh <laughs> yeah. or prisms or stuff like that. But I think the key is to like, make sure that there's a story or a subject or something in there mm -hmm. um, and make sure you're doing what you really love. Cause if, if, if it becomes your job, it's going to be most of your life. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about you, Jose? Yeah, I think to piggyback on what Dave is talking about here is just one, be as genuine as you can and be true to yourself and be real with yourself because if, if all you want is the end goal, if you are coming into it and creating this art with the end goal of I just want bigger numbers, mm -hmm. then that's going to show throughout anything you make, you know, so it's not going to come off as genuine and you can always tell who's doing it because they love, you know, photography or, or music or video and, and who's doing it because they want a certain level of success and influence. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you stay true to yourself, it might take a little longer, but the people that truly connect with you mm -hmm. are the ones that are like, are going to ma uh, matter most. Um, and two is like find seek out and, and, you know, find the communities of people that are doing the same things you're doing or like-minded people who are like trying to get to where you're, you want to get to. And if there isn't a community, then make one. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, you, you just, um, you know, one of the first things that happened to me, I was super introverted and, you know, Instagram used to host these like worldwide meetups. And I saw that a, a weekend was coming up in New York and no one had organized anything. Mm. And I was like, wait, what? no one's organized everything. Someone was like, why don't you organize it? And I was like, I, I'm so introverted. Like, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> and I was just like, I kept waiting for someone to, you know, yeah. organize something. And for a lot of things, just people don't want to plan. 
people don't want to be the planner they don't want to be the, the one that's like trying to get everyone together yeah. and that's like also people are lazy yeah people are lazy <laughs> I, i'm lazy and I, busy. I'm, I'm, yeah me too and yeah, yeah. It's, i want to be a part of this <laughs> <laughs> just go to sleep. No, exactly. especially now, you know, it's really tough to to get people together with a common goal. Yeah, especially mm -hmm. you know in in a creative pursuit. But we're all you know we're all out there, and there's yeah. a lot of creatives who are like looking for guidance or looking for communities, and they're just too lazy to organize something mm -hmm. or too lazy to get out you know from behind the screens and meet up in real life. And I think a lot of what you know the conversations that I've heard and and that Dave and I have been a part of lately is how do you bring that sense of community back? Mm -hmm. You know, how do, how do you get more people together uh, to create art in collaboration? You know, I, I think for a long time, you know, we all, you know, got our path started and our careers going and, you know, you were focused on on doing things yourself and being the one, one man band man and just doing everything, design and copywriting and, and doing all these things. Whereas I think now we're all just more concerned with working in a team and how do you make better things together with the people that you really respect mm -hmm. and you know have a, a common interest with yeah. and i think for anyone starting out it's just you know create these groups or, or you know look to work with more people love that wrapping things up what are you guys most excited about right now i'll again piggyback off what jose just said like i have been having a lot of conversations with people about how how do we um create uh, a space for people that is less um, numbers driven? How do we create a, a space where people can be themselves and meet other creative people? Like, you know, in the early days, that community was essential mm -hmm. for my creative life. I literally would not be doing this without those people. And Jose is one of those people for me is like, mm -hmm. we became friends because of this shared interest. And but it it came from meeting in person, right? Like, you know, I can respect his work from a distance as, as much as I want. But that real like bond of friendship and that has led to so much um, uh, professional success as well through our you know working together and stuff like that came because we actually got together in person with other you know and there's a ton of other people we could include um, yourself included mm -hmm. um, so I'm really interested in creating a space for people to find that type of connection just like we did and yeah. I'm gonna have a lot of news on that soon yeah so definitely wait. yeah depending on to... when this podcast comes out yeah. I'll put links down below i don't yeah it'll probably be out in like three to four weeks but stay tuned to their socials and i'm sure yeah people will, i have a lot coming up yeah. and i've been working on a project f in the background for like a year now and it's mm -hmm. about to be ready awesome and it's so gonna be exciting it's gonna be all about like you know um again rising together strength yeah. in numbers and also just this i think there's a uh, a valid um need and want to push back a little bit of against how much social media has uh, encroached into our creative yeah. lives yeah yeah that's epic jose when were you when are we gonna hear the mixtape when's that dropping <laughs> mixtape coming real soon on tiktok only good good TikTok good, good. exclusive, exclusive. Oh, tiktok oh, release yeah. got an air horn right there you go <laughs> um yeah, no hopefully yet. i'll be making some stuff <laughs> soon i'll get back into it i'm just too critical of my own stuff all the time mm, gotta get um, out of your own way but one thing is I, i'm hanging out with a lot more musicians and i kind of want to marry you know my interests and in where i've gone with my creativity and shining a light on all these other creatives who i think mm -hmm. deserve a voice or that deserve to have a bigger audience and you know how can i yeah. empower them and help them create some art together you know and how can yeah. we work together to amplify our messages Love so it. i think that's what I'm, I'm working on this year epic guys thank you so much for being on it was such a pleasure yeah thank, thank you. you so much for having us of this course is, amazing um, an honor and so much fun to discuss yeah stuff with you. no it was so it was you. fantastic and i want to keep i feel like there is such a cool uh photography community here in new york mm -hmm. um there's so many people i feel like we should have like active round tables just about oh, like yeah. creativity and yeah we were so talking fun. the other day like we did yeah. one for adorama yeah um again to, that Saul did and yeah. it was like we're like why don't we do more stuff like yeah, that? yeah 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 these yeah. conversations are so important and again like in the pushback against this like i consider social media like the fast food of information yeah so it's like i feel like for the past five years we've all just been like shoving chicken nuggets in our face <laughs> like every day and like yeah. now i think we're like ready for the maybe we're ready for the like more the... like gourmet like slow right. cooked 
uh, longer dinner. Yeah. Mother's changed my diet. Yeah. I'm ready to change my yeah, diet. No, for real. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> metaphor, guys. No, but yeah, I, I love that. And so, um, Obviously, everyone go check them out on Instagram. All their socials will be linked in the description below. Um, make sure you're subscribed to That Creative Life on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to podcasts. And until next Monday, thank you for listening. Guys, thank you for being on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.